All right, welcome everyone to this evening's One Book Belgrade virtual tie-in event, proudly brought to you by the Belgrade Community Library, revealing the science behind whirling disease. One Book Belgrade presentations are free and open to the public, thanks to a generous sponsorship by Kenyon Noble Lumber and Hardware. If you have questions about other One Book Belgrade events or our adult winter reading program, please let me know and I'll help you out. Attendees to this presentation will be entered to win one of our many winter reading prizes, including gift certificates and book packs from Country Bookshelf, local Belgrade restaurant gift cards, a fly that was tied by Keith McCafferty, complete with a glass globe and a brass nameplate, and two fly fishing trip options from Gallatin River Guides, one two-person full-day float trip and one two-person two-hour walk wade fly fishing trip. The drawings will be on April 1st. My name is Sarah Creech and I am the Adult Services Librarian here at the Belgrade Library. Before I introduce our presenter, a few Zoom tips and announcements. Attendee videos and microphones are both disabled for this presentation, but questions will be taken using both the chat and the raise hand functions. If you have a question you'd like to ask live using your voice, please click the raise hand button and at a natural stopping point, I will notify our presenter of the question and allow you to speak. If you'd rather ask your question over chat, that's fine too. I'll ask it on your behalf using your first name. I will monitor and collect the questions during the presentation, interrupting if it's timely. And uh, the chat section is also the place to let me know if you're having any technology issues. To use the chat, Click the speech bubble at the bottom of your screen if you're on a laptop or a desktop. If there's no toolbar visible, press the Alt key one time and the, um, the chat will open on the right hand side of your screen if you're not in full screen mode. If you are in full screen mode, it will appear in a window you can move around your screen by clicking and dragging the top bar. Uh, to type your message, first open the chat and click on the text that says type message here. Start typing and your message should appear where the type message here text was. To send, press enter or return. To use the raise hand feature, click the hand shape button labeled raise hand. Once you have ask your question, uh, you can lower your hand until you have another one or I can lower it for you. This event is being recorded. Closed captions are automatically enabled for this talk using PowerPoint's subtitle feature, but it doesn't seem to be capturing my speech, only our presenters, so I apologize in advance for that. Um, and then finally, please take a minute at the end of the webinar to complete the survey that will pop up. This helps the library and our sponsors know what programs bring the most interest, and it helps us improve every time. Also, since we can't see your faces today, it helps us know if you enjoyed the presentation. So finally, Tonight's presenter has spent many years focused on working to better understand the impacts of invasive species. She is currently the executive director of the Livingston, Montana based nonprofit Invasive Species Action Network. She is passionate about problem solving and building successful relationships to achieve invasive species management goals. And with degrees from both University of Montana and Montana State University, her master's research was focused directly on better understanding the ecological relationships of Nixobolus cerebralis, the parasite that causes whirling disease and its hosts. And I will uh, share a little bit more about how I found our presenter. Um, for those of you who have read the book, The Royal Wolf Murders, know that a big plot point and um, piece is discussion about whirling disease in Montana and Montana's rivers. And I spent a long time searching for someone local who could talk about it because it's not really in the news anymore. And finally, I found a white paper that was published in 2009, and it is called Whirling Disease in the United States, a Summary of Progress in Research and Management, and it was published in 2009. So our presenter has been in the thick of whirling disease research for a long time. and. Uh, I did not read the paper, I will be honest. It's 66 pages long. If you're interested, I'll drop it in the chat. But it's my pleasure and I welcome you to give a warm and silent welcome to our presenter, Leah Elwell. And it's now her turn to talk. So over to you, Leah, thanks. Thank you for that warm welcome, Sarah. I appreciate it. Uh, well, it's wonderful to be here with you guys this evening. I appreciate the invitation. 
And I really hope, um, you know, I, the information I share is helpful in how you, um, I guess, discuss the book at a later date, I'm assuming. So yes, revealing the science behind whirling disease. Um, I uh, haven't actually, I was telling Sarah, you know, I spent a lot of time thinking about whirling disease, but not recently. So it was kind of nice for me to go back and you know, revisit and rethink through and look at some of the, the things that I spent quite a bit of time on in, in my past. So um, I am going to explain things from, you know, really a scientific perspective, but I hope I can bring you along. And, you know, if there's certain words that um, need more, uh, you know, explanation, I'm, I'm happy to help um, provide where I can there. So I did want to do a little more introduction. And, you know, Sarah did um, you know, read the, the, the bio type information that I provided, but I, um, but I also just kind of wanted to share, you know, my enthusiasm for science and who I am in terms of why I'm here presenting to you today. Um, for a long time, I, as a young person, I was, I was very interested in science and biology, and it led me to go pursue degrees, you know, both in ecology and aquatic wildlife biology, and then I landed in Bozeman. And first, I actually, um, um, I didn't automatically go right to the university there. I had another job and I ended up actually doing a ton of field work related to um, some whirling disease um, beginning studies. And then all of a sudden here, I was uh, pursuing a master's degree. And then it just continued from, from there on out. And so I really spent a lot of time on the rivers around Bozeman and um, but also in the laboratory at MSU or many laboratories there. Uh, but there came a point when I said, I really want to get out and talk more about these things. I'm enthusiastic about science and biology. And I felt like in the lab, I was getting a little trapped in there. So that's what brought me to the nonprofit world and where I work now um, with Invasive Species Action Network. Um, you may not have heard of us. We're a little bit quiet. We work with a lot of partners across the West. Um, we problem solve, as um, um, Sarah mentioned, and I, that's the part I like the, the, the most. We work with different state, federal, tribal entities and um, work on prevention strategies for invasive species. Um, so with that, now we'll dive into um, the whirling disease world. So the players in the whirling disease story, we need to start out so we're all on the same page and, and you know um, a little bit here of the, 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 the cast members, if you will. So Mixobolus cerebralis is the parasite that actually causes whirling disease. So this, that's really the, the, the main event here is Mixobolus cerebralis. And most people know that it affects trout. Whirling disease is, you know, it's recognizable that it's a, it's a trout problem and that's very true. So the, the nice rainbow that you see here is one of the hosts of the parasite. Um, but the other host is our nice, uh, you can see those little curly cues on the screen there. Those are a type of aquatic worm. So they're a worm that live in um, streams and lakes, um, but it's a very specific worm. It's only one kind of worm. It's called Tubifex Tubifex. That's its Latin name, but that's its name. Um, so we have our parasite, Mixobolus cerebralis. We have our um, singular worm host, Tubifex Tubifex. And then also wanted to point out, I guess, before we leave this slide, that trout, you know, most people recognize that it's rainbow trout, but it's really a whole, the, the salmonid family, the group of um, fish that salmon and trout fall into, to varying degrees, some of those species of fish can be affected by the parasite. So it's not just rainbows. And I will get to that later on as we um, learn more about this. But, um, but so the parasite, the, the worm and, and our trout and salmon species. So um, some of you again, may be familiar again with this whirling disease idea in trout. And this is kind of a common picture. If you were gonna you know, Google search for whirling disease, this one's probably gonna come up. And this is what I would say a very um, extreme visualization of the clinical form. So these are very sick fish. They have been infected by the parasite and they're displaying. So you can see that the, the end of their tail, both of those fish are blackened. So that is not healthy. You can also see that crook in the tail end of the fish 
And that is also not the tail of the, the fish is not flicking its tail, that it's actually a deformed tail um, from the parasite manifesting itself in the fish. So that's very typical, but now you know there's a worm in hall, which we're gonna learn more about. So how does the whirling disease um, story fit into our local area here? Which is, it really does. It's actually kind of the epicenter of some of what unfolded here in the 90s. And um, so in 1993, I have a flag down there also on Colorado. In 1993, there, uh, as biologists, they often look at fish populations on an annual or semi-annual basis. Um, so monitoring numbers for you know, fish health and all these things. So, but on the Gunnison River in particular, biologists noticed just a just an absolute drop in the number of fish. There were just 90% fish loss. And so that's obviously very dramatic if we went out fishing and 90% of the fish weren't there anymore. So that was in about 1993, that's when it sort of came to light and was documented. And then pretty quickly afterwards in 1994, very similarly, we saw this huge decline in rainbow trout on the Madison River um, and also some other areas in Montana, the Madison's kind of really known for that event, um, but also on Rock Creek outside of Missoula. And then also um, biologists noted it in different areas on the Missouri River as well. So this was obviously a big deal to lose this, um, you know, I think there was this dramatic, what's gonna happen here, the, you know, we've, are we gonna never ever be able to fish for, for rainbows ever again? Um, but the interesting thing was, is that this wasn't, whirling disease wasn't new to fish biologists. What was new is that it was found in wild populations. So finding it on the Madison was, you know, a jaw dropper um, for, for many years. So in the fifties, around the fifties is when it was discovered in fish hatchery in the United States. So this is a picture here, this little, what they call runway, that sort of green um, strip there that has lots of fish in it. So that's a hatchery. And it was known to be a problem in hatchery fish um, starting in the US, as I said, in the 50s. But even decades prior to that, um, it'd been documented elsewhere in Europe. Um, so, you know, scientists knew about whirling disease from, you know, the beginning of the 1900s. So it wasn't a new thing. Um, and really the thought was, oh, we can contain it. It can stay in the hatchery. So I think that was the, the alarming part of why are we seeing this in wild fish? And, and that's exactly right. So we have the Madison River with, you know, the iconic fisheries of, of note. And the other thing I want to point out that is kind of interesting and, and unique to Montana and the fisheries, um, in the mid 70s, the, the Fish, Wildlife and Parks took an amazing leap of faith, uh, or maybe it wasn't of faith, it was smart. Um, the, the stocking of fish, um, you know, was happening all over the place in terms of how fish management happened. It went into rivers and lakes, which is very similar to what you'd see elsewhere in the US, not, not anything special to Montana. But what, what did happen that was special in Montana in the 70s is that they decided to stop stocking with hatchery trout or with hatchery fish into rivers, into rivers. So that was a really a big move and it turned out to be very successful. Of uh, you know, the fish that were there, um, they could be supported by, you know, our really productive um, streams and, and rivers. So we knew that we weren't stocking these uh, potentially whirling disease fish into the Madison River. So what was uh, what was going on here? Um, and you know the rainbow trout too. I just want to highlight something about trout in general. You know, rainbow are one of the most beloved fish. Um, really in the world. They've been moved to every with the exception of Antarctica. Well, they're native to parts of the United States. Um, you know, they're not native everywhere, but, um, but they really are an iconic fish and they really meant a lot to the angling community um, in Montana, certainly, but also, you know, globally. So getting into why are we seeing this decline in rainbow trout on the Madison River was, um, 
something that was a priority to understand. So around, uh, you know, right around this time, so we saw this precipitous decline um, and everyone was absolutely um, concerned of what was gonna happen. Um, in 1995, um, there was a strong move that was made, some of you might know or remember uh, Senator Conrad Burns, who was a longtime Senator for Montana. And he, at the time, um, at the time of, in 1995, uh, you also might remember some of you that um, Yellowstone National Park was beginning a wolf reintroduction program. I think it'd been ongoing, um, that's not my specialty. So it had already started, but at that time in 1995, Conrad Burns kind of did this dramatic move and diverted funding that was for that wolf reintroduction program and put it $200,000, which doesn't sound like a lot, but it was a big move and put that towards um, whirling disease research so they could better understand what was happening on the Madison. Um, because, you know, honestly, uh, biologists out here were getting phone calls from uh, senators from all across the US, from people on the East Coast that would come here and know how great the fishing were and saying, you've got to do something, you've got to fix this. So there really was kind of that crisis feeling of, you know, how do we, where do we go from here? Um, and boy, did we do some research. So um, before I go any further, I wanted to go over some, I guess, definitions. I wanted to get things straight with you guys because I'm going to mention them multiple times. So I thought if you could at least see it, if you're very visual on words. So I've already mentioned our parasite, which is Myxobolus cerebralis. And that I just want to point out too. So that's the parasite that causes whirling disease. It doesn't cause whirling disease in the worm. That's just the manifestation of the, the parasite in the fish. So our parasite also has two life stages. So the mixospore is one, which is a, I'm, I'm gonna get to some cool pictures of this stuff, but that's the paras, the life stage of the parasite that is eaten by our tube effects worm, the obligatory host. So, and then I've already mentioned our friend tube effects, tube effects, that little tiny aquatic worm. And then the next life stage of the parasite, so after that worm eats it, it um, the next life stage is the TAM that's, that comes out of the worm or the triactinum myxon. And then finally, that TAM is what affects any of number of fish the, of the, in the, the trout and salmon fam, uh, excuse me, family or salsalmonids. And then finally, I just wanna reiterate again that whirling disease is that manifestation of the parasite in salmonids. So, um, so there we go. So let's take a closer look at these different life stages when they get into the host. So the mixospore, here it is. It's, these are some cool illustrations that actually came out of that white paper by this talented person named Claire Emery. So, but the mixospore, um, it's this circular thing. It looks kind of like um, a little alien head actually with its um, almost like two little eyes. Um, it's a very small um, in, in nature. It's about the size, um, it's microscopic, but it's about the size of a red blood cell. We just compare it to something else, but it's microscopic. So we have our worms that are embedded into the sediment in the stream. They're, you know, what worms do is they actually just randomly eat particles that are in, whether it's mud or the sand or whatever it is they're living in. So they inadvertently just pick up mixospores as they're eating, as they're consuming. And uh, once the parasite is um, inside the worm, in the gut of that worm, then the parasite goes through a transformation and um, it starts to create the triactinum myxon. So you can see in the, the far right picture, the worm is expelling uh, the triactinum myxon. So basically they're kind of pooping it out. And the triactinum myxon is a little bit bigger um, than the mixospore. Um, let's see here, but I do want to show you before we move on. So this is looking at the mixospores underneath the microscope. So scientists can do this. We can um, pull the parasite actually out of sick fish and separate using like, you know, scientific blenders basically and centrifuges and stuff like that. And we can get, you know, this nice picture of, okay, well, we've got the, the parasite here. So that's, that's the mixospore. 
This is a close up of a worm. So obviously they're not in a stream. I don't, you know, you could probably go to the stream and pick up, you know, a handful of sediment and come across a worm, but they are pretty small. And, you know, honestly, you know, I, that's not that normal. I pick up rocks all the time and I don't necessarily see tubifex, tubifex worms out there, but this is what they look like. Um, pretty tiny, but they're just little worms. Um, and they are sitting in a well plate, kind of more close up than normal. And this is the kind of thing that we can use in the lab. So we would put individual worms in here and we can make observations on them. Are they sick with the, the parasite or not? So tooth effects worms in a well plate. Okay, so, and this is the triactin and mixon. So again, this is a whole, a whole load of them, lots and lots of them. And these were, you know, could have been taken out of that well plate that we just saw. So the worm could have been expelling, actively expelling the parasite. And I can take a little pipette and pull out this and look under a microscope. So the size of the triactin and mixon is about, if you were reading in your book, it's about the size of uh, a period in a sentence. So not very large either. Um, and just, I just wanted to give you, cause it's kind of hard to tell in that picture where they're all smashed together. So this is kind of really what it's shaped like. And I always described it as a grappling hook. So those bottom, you know, the hook pieces there and then the top part that's labeled as the, um, I guess I could do this. Um, this top part here is really that active part of the parasite that's gonna end up in the fish eventually. So, but this, these other pieces kind of help make it buoyant. Okay, so continuing with this life cycle piece. So we have the worms have just expelled the parasite, the, the triactin mixon. They're floating in the water column, they're floating in the stream, and they come across the right fish. It has to be the right fish. If they came across a bass, it's not going to work. So if they came across a trout, it's going to be potentially successful. So it embeds into the, the skin of the fish, or it could actually even attach to the gills. And then that active portion of the, the, the triactin and mixon is then injected into the trout. Then the parasite moves through the fish until it finds what it, you know, it wants to, to transform back into the mixospore. So the parts that it likes are actually the cartilage in the, in the fish. And it's often, if we are looking for the parasite, that are, they are often found in places in actually the, the skull or the head area of, um, of trap, that's a common place for it to be found. So, um, so we have our infected fish, the mix of spores have been produced. It's not until the um, fish actually dies and starts to decompose that then those mix of spores can then just be released back into the sediment. And then of course the tube effects worm has to find it again. So it's this big loop of, you know, host to parasite to host to parasite. So, um, so that's the essentials of how that works. The fish, I just wanna talk, go back to this nice fish picture. Um, you know, this fish could be infected with whirling disease and we might not know it. So the, the earlier pictures I showed with the blackened tail and the curved um, are those extreme clinical versions, but it could still live a fine life and then die and decompose and then release those mix of spores eventually. That is possible. So this probably looks like a really crazy picture to you guys, but this is a chemically dyed cross section. So a really thin section of the skull of a sick, potentially sick fish. So scientists can use techniques like this. And this is, um, one that's used often in the fish health world. So they could take a cross section of an infected fish and then look for the parasite. They can look for in areas like this and say, oh, we have loss of cartilage or inflamed cartilage. It could be right here in this part of the fish. So obviously you would have to have a dead fish to look at this, but this is just one of those techniques that we could use to examine how severe an infection um, a fish was subjected to. So um, let's see, I think here is where I wanted to offer the opportunity if there was any questions 
or um, clarifications, mostly on the, the life cycle itself, if there was any confusion there. Um, but if not, I can keep going forward. Okay, hearing nothing. Yeah, I don't see anything from the chat, so. Okay, excellent. That means I explained it well, <laughs> exhaustively. <laughs> All right, so here we go. So in continuing this, I, you know, I, the life cycle of that was really important to relay. And now we can kind of get back into a little bit of, I don't know if it's the drama, but it was a little bit of the drama of Lilly disease. So if we go back to the 90s and, you know, we have this insurgence of funding that keeps coming in and it kicks off really this international, um, you know, scientific pursuit of understanding um, this parasite and, and its hopes. So these are, this is just a snapshot, but this is some of the people that I would have been interacting with back in the day. And they did tremendous work on this topic. And on the, the left-hand side here, you know, all the things that were explored, any kind of aspect related to the fish um, in terms of their, how did they respond to the parasite? any single you know, detail of, of the parasite, um, which I'm gonna share some of these pieces that were explored. Um, what about the, the, the worm host? What did we know about that? What do we understand about the, the habitat that we find the parasite in? Um, all those parameters of why things worked out or didn't work out in terms of the, the parasite doing well. And then, you know, looking at the, the hatcheries and, you know, are there protocols that we could use to protect our fish and protect the habitats that are, that could be affected by hatchery fish. Um, there was also a lot of different entities that, you know, came forward. The pictures I have here are some specific scientists that I, you know, interacted with. And I, you may not know a single one of these people, but some of them are Montan. And so in red, that's, you know, Dick Vincent, who did a lot of work on the Madison. Um, Billy Kern, well, Eileen Rice is still there too in, in the blue shirt there at the bottom. Um, but we also had these other entities too that have, some of them have come and gone, but some of them are still there. So we there was the Wild Trout Laboratory that was on MSU campus and that's since been renamed. Um, I think it's like the Invertebrate Laboratory now or something. Um, the Water Center was a leader in helping to funnel uh, uh, funding to researchers. We had the actual uh, nonprofit called the Whirling Disease Foundation that was centered in Bozeman and they hosted meetings and helped support all kinds of research. And then of course the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service that's based out of Bozeman here, um, they have the Fish Health Laboratory and they did, you know, the last picture I showed with the, the cross-section of the fish, you know, they were instrumental in doing a lot of that diagnostic and, you know, critical information on, um, on the fish itself. So this really gigantic global world of research was kicked off in the 90s. So what did we learn? And I'm gonna kind of, again, break this into a couple of sections, um, starting with the parasite. And, um, and there, there's a lot to know. I mean, people spent so much time looking at multiple aspects of this, the one singular species, which is pretty amazing. Um, but for origins, I think that's of note, and you're probably wondering where has this thing from. Um, it's believed that, you know, I mentioned the hatchery uh, uh, discovery in the 50s on the East Coast, in Pencil out of Pennsylvania. But where did they come from before that? Right. So it's believed that hatchery fish that originated in Germany were that were in infected were brought to the US and that's what essentially brought the parasite here. Um, and, you know, it's interesting. So if we know that, you know, the origins of the parasite are in Europe, um, any anglers that are listening, you may know that, you know, brown trout are also um, native to um, Europe and that, Brown be kind of resistant to it. They don't show many signs of being um, capable of being infected by this parasite. And it's thought that because of like the, maybe the words co-evolution that they were, because they evolved together, that the brown trout were, were with the parasite, that that's why they, they don't show signs in 
um, brown trout that we see even here in the United States. So other thing of note that was kind of significant, and it just, I think just sort of plays a role in, or it gives light on how scientists really can work and work and work on things. And it's really fascinating. We can just continue to discover new things all the time. So, you know, the species was described in, you know, the early 1900s and it wasn't until the eighties that they did, that they actually discovered. So I should put up the pictures of the, the mixospore and the triactinomyxin. And it wasn't until the eighties that they realized that it was one singular species. They thought all along that the mixospore was one species and the triactinomyxin was another. And then, so science really, a lot, like at one point allowed us to converge and go, oh, okay, this is actually one species. So that's of note. Um, some of the things that, um, that were looked at too, of course, are how can we just, you know, I guess, destroy this species? What do we do in the lab at least? You know, what, what, is, what are the things that um, harm the parasite? Um, so a number of things have been looked at. Bleach and UV can, um, you know, harm the parasite, but it depends actually on the concentration of certainly of the bleach. If it's fairly concentrated, you will kill um, both forms of this parasite and UV can, but again, it's, you know, not five minutes in the sun. It would have to be pretty considerable. Um, and freezing, um, you know, it has to be below five degrees, which is quite cold, five degrees centigrade, um, and held at that temperature for, for many, many days. I think it's two months and then deactivate um, the, the parasites. The, the trichinomyxon, or the, the mixospore, I should say. So the trichinomyxon, um, it may not be self-evident, but it's a little bit more fragile. Those mixospores can live in the sediment for, gosh, you know, decades. Um, but the trichinomyxon, they're a little more fragile and they're floating in the stream. So turbulence and then seasonal temperatures can really affect its, you know, survival. And they're really, they're, they're fragile. They're not going to live that long. So, which could be a good thing, I guess. Um, okay, so I wanna talk about the different species of trout. This is, I brought it up a couple of times, so I wanna spend a little more time on this with you guys. And I came across this, I love this poster. It's from the University of Wisconsin. And I was like, oh, this is perfect. You know, so this is our Salmonidae family and it has, you know, uh, a lot of variation in it. We have, you know, salmon that we're familiar with because we might want to eat them, but then we have some of our other trout species like um, brown trout, but there's also things like lake trout and brook trout and, um, and others. We also have over there on the, the top right are the lake, or sorry, the whitefish who are also part of this family, and then um, ciscos as well. But um, but really just a huge variation of fish and a huge variation in how they respond to this parasite. And the differences that they show, um, I just wanted to, I didn't, there's, a, there's other information. There's more species that have been tested for their susceptibility, but I just wanted to include a few that were of note. Um, obviously we've talked that Rainbow trout is one of the most susceptible ones. And then several of the, the cutthroat um, uh, trout species as well. But I think what was really interesting too that came out of lots of digging around is that whitefish too. And they are an important fish in our, you know, fish community, you know, in Montana. And, you know, they're an important, important angling fish. And, but they're highly susceptible to this parasite. And then sockeye salmon as well, which, you know, that's no good if we really like sockeye salmon. Um, but the less susceptible, this is kind of interesting. So we talked, I mentioned the brown trout and this is, you know, believed to be because both the parasite and the, the brown trout were able to, you know, uh, evolve, co-evolve. Um, but also, and maybe thankfully too, uh, the bull trout are not as um, susceptible to infection. Lake trout, aren't, and then fish like grayling. So um, really just this mix and there's some obvious genetic differences. There are some other reasons why this could be in terms of susceptibility, which um, I will talk about um, in a little bit, but um, 
but just really a huge variation in, in how it displays itself in, in the trout and salmon. So one of the techniques that um, Fish, Wildlife and Parks used for many years to look at what was going on in rivers and not just for whirling disease, you could use this technique for other problems that you might wanna examine. Um, but in the grass, you can see there, it's called a sentinel cage. And it's, you know, uh, at least as big as a, a five gallon bucket, but you can see there's mesh that's on the outside there. And this is, you know, they, you know, it get, gets secured in the stream with a piece of rebar. And then you actually put small fish in there. You take a hatchery fish and it's secured. So the fish is not going to get out of there, but then you keep it in the, the stream or the river for a certain amount of time. And then you would take the fish out and make observations. So in this case, I put my little floating tams in the, the river here. Um, so, you know, you put trout in the, the sentinel cage. And then um, this allows us to look at, well, infection rates, essentially. So if there are tons of TAMs that are moving downstream that we might probably see a really, um, you know, severe infection display in the fish later on, once we get a, a chance for that to take place in the lab. Or maybe we put it out there and there is very little infection. So, um, you know, there's a lot of, variables that, you know, if you were doing this as a scientific experiment, you'd want to control those so you knew definitively what was going on. But, um, but yes, and once the fish was exposed, like I said, you could take it to the lab and it takes some time for the, the parasite to develop, but then you could make those observations later. So that was, a, is a really actually helpful technique. So what we also learned um, after lots of research is that there are some reasons that we would see different kinds of infections. So age of the fish, the size of the fish, and then something called life history. So it was pretty clear that after looking at different sizes of the fish, and I mean little fish, so little young fish is what these guys are, um, young of the year. So these smaller, younger fish are, and very young fish are very, um, they're gonna be highly impacted if they get exposed to the parasite. If we have an adult fish that's you know, two years old, they are gonna be, be able to, they could withstand you know, a high parasite load and just be fine. But because these fish, uh, smaller fish have potentially more cartilage, um, it's just more damaging to um, their growth and development when they get exposed to it, which obviously, having blocking out, you know, young groups of young age of fish is not healthy for the long-term of, of the, the fish population. Um, so life history, it, it could also be a factor. And when I say some of the, the factors in, in that kind of situation for you guys to visualize what that might mean is um, when and where a fish is spawning. So in these side channels, if we talk about the Madison River, let's say in side channels, it's you know lower flow, there might be more sediment. So there might be more worms there and there might be places where the mixospore has settled more. And, but it's also a nice safe place for spawn and for young of the year fish to grow up. So, you know, having all those factors on top of each other, those life history choices where the fish might spawn could lead to, wow, we really see a lot of this infection here. So that, that spawning, the location, and then also the timing, um, you know, there's different species of fish spawn at different times. So if you're a fish species that's spawning when all the TAMs are in the, the or all the, the triactinomyxons are in the water, then, you know, unfortunately that's not gonna work out well for those young fish. So where other fish, maybe it's too, the temperature's too cold, that they might do better. So it, I think you're starting to see that this is pretty complex of why we may um, see different patterns of what goes on um, with the parasite in the wild. Um, the last thing I wanted to talk about with, um, with the fish, I wanna talk more about worms and stuff too here. Um, the last thing I want to talk about with the fish is, you know, I call I 
it, it was dubbed as the super fish potentially. So I think for folks in places like Colorado where they did quite a bit of hatchery stocking, um, but as I mentioned before, Montana was not stocking their, um, their rivers. So, but there was, if we could come up with a fish that could replace, uh, you know, our susceptible rainbow trout, if we could find a, a strain of the rainbow trout that was resistant to the parasite, then we would be just, you know, all set. So the, the picture you see with all those little fish lined up, so the one column are, you know, quote, wild fish. They may have been hatchery fish, but they were, you know, collected from the wild and exposed to the parasite, much smaller and, you know, obviously look less healthy than what was, you know, cultivated or grown up as these resistant fish. So much bigger, much happier, and, you know, ultimately I think could lead to a, a more successful fish out there. So, um, you know, Colorado Parks and Wildlife did a lot of research on that. And I think that they did end up ultimately um, using a strain of fish that of rainbow trout that they did stock. And I think others did too in Utah, I believe. Um, so that was certainly one dynamic um, that felt like was a, a concern and a need for folks if, you know, certainly we were on the verge of losing rainbow trout, which we thankfully haven't yet. So, um, all right, so now I wanna transition and talk a little bit about um, the worms. And really the worms were more, the worms and the parasite were more together, were my focus of the work that I did. And um, I mentioned that these are, you know, little aquatic worms found throughout the United States. Um, you know, they're just, they're part of the community of what you would find, you know, in the stream bottom. So it could be other bugs are there, um, all kinds of other little creatures they inhabit with um, in the stream. So there are, um, if we go to look at these underneath the microscope, which I did a lot of stuff like this, which I think is pretty neat stuff. And these are really high powered microscopes. But so these features, they're like the little hairs um, on the worm, not the long hairs, but they're, but these kind of characteristics are what we use to identify worms when we wanna know the difference between these different species. So, and these things are called kitty, but I just thought, I, I looked at so much of this kind of stuff that I wanted to make sure you um, got to see some of the stuff that I got to see. Um, and, but what's interesting I wanna mention is that not all worm species are the same. So tube effects, tube effects is not the only aquatic worm out there. There's many other worm species that it, you know, co-lives with. And what another thing I spent a lot of time looking at underneath a microscope um, is trying to see the difference between some of the, um, uh, worm species. And of course, so I've highlighted in those red circles, the way that we tell, you know, a lot of insects and invertebrates apart is of course using their, you know, sex parts. And that's exactly what's highlighted here. So this is two different worm species. So the one here on the left is called Limnodrillus. And this long, um, it's called its penis sheath is what you identify to compare it next to this over here is our tube effects worm. And it's like this little, you know, hat shaped thing, but obviously two very different features. You can tell the difference between these two very different worms, even though, you know, they look like little worms, <laughs> very similar. So anyway, just to give a little insight of how, um, you know, deep in uh, we can get as scientists and trying to understand species. So the other thing that we learned in doing some research is that not all tube effects, tube effects are the same. So it was observed that there was actual genetic strains. So depending, and it mostly looked like geographic origin. So if you were a worm that were in this certain part of the country or certain part of the world, you may be exposed to the parasite and really not produce that much of it. Um, and find another strain of the worm and you're exposed to it and it's gangbusters. So there, there was a pattern that you could see different strains of tube effects, tube effects did not um, produce the same amount of um, triactinum exons. 
It was also observed too that water temperature was key in how um, successful uh, that parasite was in the worm. So if it was at just the right temperature, so like 10 to 15 degrees C, then it was like gangbusters with the, the triactinum exons. If it got too warm, then that would, it would just be shut down. So, um, and then finally substrate. So of course, you know, I can certainly picture a worm being really happy if it was in mud and sand and those kinds of things and not so happy if it was in gravel. So, um, and that makes sense that there's a little bit of, you know, um, the, if there's the right substrates and the, um, the host is happy and it's finding, you know, the right conditions to live in, but this actually, you know, magnifies what we see in terms of the parasite. So, um, okay, so looping this all back to where we started on the Madison River, um, and you're probably wondering about that, where, what happened to the trout and where is whirling disease? Because nobody talks about it really anymore. Um, so, and what's cool again, we talked about like this huge decline. So in the eighties, the kind of, the kind of numbers that fish biologists would find, you know, around it was 750 trout per mile. That's a lot of fish. It really is a lot of fish to find per mile. And the Madison is unique in that. If you look at other fish or, you know, productive streams in the world, the Madison is a little bit special. Um, and then the, the decline that you see there in the 1990s, it went down to 194. That's pretty sad and pretty pitiful. But then by 2015, we were back up there in the, you know, seven, 800 range. So, um, some of the speculation about why we could see a pattern like this. And I think in hindsight, biologists might say different things too, but like at that time, you know, closer to, you know, the beginning of the 2000s, let's say, there was talk that maybe there was just resistance. So the fish that did survive, those rainbow trout that did survive, they were resistant and then their children were resistant. So we have now, you know, slightly more resistant rainbow trout. It's possible, um, but we don't have a lot of, that's kind of more anecdotal. Um, it could be that spawning locations, it could be that some of the fish went up into some different tributary areas and were really successful for multiple years. And you know that translates into what we see in the main stem. And those spawning places could have been places that there weren't any of the parasites. So that's a good thing. Um, and maybe there were, the other thing is stress. Was there some kind of event? Um, that could have maybe be correlated to and um, that would create an event. And I, if you pay attention to things that go on on the river out here, those, those kinds of fish kill things can happen. This was certainly a dramatic one and, and a little bit different, but, um, but so that's kind of where we are um, with the rainbow trout on the, the Madison. And I will say too, is that the parasite is still out there. There are mixes for us. Um, so, and there's still, uh, you know, the, the worms are still there as well. So it's not that whirling disease has gone away. It is still out there. And, um, yes, so that is hundred percent the case. Um, one of the things question. too that Leah, yes. Hi, I have a quick question. Um, sure, yeah. kind of going through the book to kind of find related questions, but with that specific, uh, increase in rainbow trout per mile. I, and I think you might've mentioned this a little bit before, but just to reiterate, is any of that from um, stocking the rivers with healthy fish from hatcheries or no? Okay. No, they still, the Montana's Fish, Wildlife and Parks does not stock rivers. Still the case. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, okay, so I just want to touch on this idea too, um, with that sort of crisis feeling of, you know, we're going to lose our fisheries. There was a lot of talk of we're not going to have um, the tourism dollars and we're not going to have the guide days and we're not going to have this, but really it didn't translate into that. Interestingly enough, um, there was still, you know, there may have been some period where it seemed like less, but overall, you know, there were still uh, fish in the river and there was brown trout in the river as well. Um, so overall, I think anglers were still, for the most part, satisfied. 
Where I would say that we did see economic impact that does relate to the parasite would be in the hatchery system. So if you happen to have a hatchery or you know, there's, excuse me, there's state hatcheries and there's private hatcheries, and this could be anywhere, it doesn't have to relate to Montana at all. But if somehow your hatchery becomes, um, the parasite gets in there and you have to destroy you know, a huge lot of fish or um, you know, your water, get incoming water has the parasite in it and you have to totally revamp your hatchery, I mean, that could be a game changer. A, if you're losing those fish, you were gonna stop. That's just outright, um, you know, both loss of the fish and um, loss of that uh, productivity. But then if you had to totally revamp your hatchery, um, then with new technology, new equipment, new whatever to, to be rid of the parasite, then that just could shut things down. And so that's really where I think we saw the biggest impact or even could continue to see the biggest impact would be um, in the hatchery system. Um, in communicating about whirling disease, I think this is really interesting too. And I, I actually talked a little bit about this with Sarah earlier and that, you know, in the nineties, when we saw this happen, um, you know, in my mind, the parasite, it was, it was an introduced species. It was an invasive species, but it was really um, couched as this fish health issue that was happening. And then that made it kind of tough to talk about and tough to explain. And, and really there wasn't a lot of good communication about what anglers could do or should do. And um, I think looking back on that, we were really in, you know, just, it was just a different time. And we've really evolved in how we think about preventing the spread of different things in um, all kinds of environments. Um, and certainly for whirling disease, you know, so if you are wearing waders and with felt sole, you know, bottoms on them and you're in the sediment, I mean, yes, you could conceivably pick up whirling disease. And then if you do not clean your gear, you can move it. So um, coming up with just really simple stuff would have been ideal at that time. But I think something was kind of lost in translation at that time. So um, I think, but now we have that message of prevention kind of nailed down and which is good. It makes me feel better. But again, I think it, it was viewed as a fish health issue. And that was, that was part of um, the difference back then. So as I approach the end here, I just, you know, again, this, this it seeps into really all the work that I do at Invasive Species Action Network. And I just wanted to even stress this when we talk about invasive species, which, you know, I include um, the, that parasite, Mesabrella cerebralis in, but inv invasive species and ones that we don't want to spread could be all kinds of things, right? So it could be plants. Um, it could be animals, so that's the, a zebra mussel in the middle, or it could be microbes, so the parasite. And then this, the picture that I put over there that has the, the person's arms are, um, it's a specific algae called dinimo. So invasive species can take, take all kinds of forms, um, but the bottom line is with all this stuff, regardless, I don't, I, I, you hopefully know a lot more about whirling disease, but I wouldn't expect you to know where whirling disease is everywhere. Like I wouldn't expect you to know where zebra mussels were everywhere. So the bottom line to me is that you want to always clean your gear. It doesn't matter what you're doing or where you've been. The easiest thing to do, so we have our nice dirty muddy boot in the middle that could have whirling disease spores on it. We just want to clean it. Same with the boat. Um, so the, the clean, drain, dry mantra that um, hopefully you have noticed, um, you know, in traveling around the state, it's, you know, it's simple and it's effective and it hits anything and everything in terms of, you know, just preventing the risk of all kinds of stuff, not just whirling disease. And on that note too, just wanted to like plug our other, don't let it loose. We never want to dump anything that like in an aquarium or, or even, uh, you know, fish parts from fishing. So, um, it's easy to take a few simple steps to make sure that we're not, you know, moving things around. So um, with that, um, I hope I have left you with some, you know, I, I know I've left you with a lot of detail and I didn't even cover all of it. it you know, I did have to pick and choose. So I hope I've left you with the, the, the enough morsels that, that tie back into the book that you guys are, are going to read and discuss. 
And if you want to learn more about invasive species issues, the work that we do at Invasive Species Action Network, you can go to our website and learn more about what we do. So thank you so much for um, letting me chat with you today. So if you have any questions, I, I would welcome them. Thank you, Leah. Um, there is one question and I have a few um, passages from the book that I wanna ask oh, okay. about specifically later. So Michelle says, how long would the parasite remain viable outside the river on a pair of waders? Maybe if you didn't clean them. Well, it is kind of anecdotal. Like it, we don't have an absolute number, but um, you know, the science says it's like the mixed spore itself could live anywhere between five and like 30 years. So if you left, and I think there has been a lot of talk about waders being the one thing that, you know, if you don't clean them. So keeping them moist, like in a gear bag, in your truck, whatever, you know, you could potentially move them. So it's not like they wouldn't be viable in five days. They could be viable for a long time. <laughs> yes. Okay. That, yeah. yeah, that's pretty telling, I think, when yes. part of the issues, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, yeah. So a lot of uh, the main character in the book is Sean, and he is a private investigator, a private detective. Um, and he has just moved to Montana, and he is a fly, a fly fisherman, and he's learning about whirling disease as part of an ongoing investigation that he's doing. Um, okay. And he is learning from someone who actually, you know, calls out some of the groups you mentioned in the beginning, the um, anglers against whirling disease and um, things like that. And they talk a lot about how, yes, you can track it with your waders, but it's also um, transmitted through birds. Like, it, and I don't know if this is true, which is what I want, the question is, is if a bird eats a fish that has been infected, um, if when the bird poops on another river, does that spread whirling disease? I mean, conceivably it could. Is I'm not saying way? it could. It would take, it would take, you know, so the cartilage would, you know, so it's the parasites in the fish, it would still have to decompose and degrade. It would take time. It's not impossible. Okay. It's not impossible, but you know, that's kind of the stuff that it's, and those things have come up too, that, oh, there's mud on, you know, a bird's leg and couldn't it move, you know, but the likelihood of those things, well, I don't know, it's possible and it's been talked about, but I think, you know, for us as humans, I, we always have to just revert back to like, well, I can't control that that great blue heron is going to be flying you know, to a new watershed. So we want the great blue heron, don't we? So that's why, like, I always just go back to like, yeah, it's possible, but it's way easier for us to deal with us, right? Right, with <laughs> so, the clean drain dry, we can't tell the yes, blue with cleaning your that, stuff, right? exactly. Makes, makes more sense. Yeah, awesome. Yeah. Um, and then, I mean. Yeah, that you know, you covered most of the questions I actually had from the book, so I'm I'm okay. I'm thrilled because I was like, I have questions about this, but now they are all answered. So if anyone else has oh, specific good. questions about the book, please do you know raise your hand or drop them in the chat. Um, but while you're thinking about that, uh, Leah and I were chatting a little bit before everybody um, got on the event or logged onto the event, and I wanted to ask you about the the news um, with invasive species right now. So I don't know if everyone has heard about this very dramatic um, recall and uh, warnings of invasive species that are being sold in pet stores. So I wanted Leah to kind of right. tell us a little I bit know, about that and the impact. Yeah, inadvertently yeah. being sold in pet stores, right. accidental, but um, so think yes. about your questions about whirling disease and drop those in the chat, but I'll let Leah kind of tell us a little bit about the, the new, the news about right. <laughs> happening. So it does, it's, it's been a bit of the, the, the commotion in the invasive species world. And so if you don't know about what happened about, uh, now it's almost like two weeks, 
but um, a pet store employee in Seattle came across a product that is sold in for aquariums and it's called a moss bunny. So it's this little ball and it's actually, it's actually algae and it's not moss, bunny, but that's okay. Anyway, but embedded in this accidentally were invasive zebra mussels. Okay. Which they're one of the, the invasives we're most concerned about. So in terms of moving, so anyhow, it kind of caused a huge nation, nationwide alarm. Um, managers across the entire country went and looked at other pet stores and indeed found the same product to be contaminated. So it really just reminded us there are other ways that things can get spread because that one certainly wasn't on the radar. And it's really flagging for folks of like, okay, it's really important to dispose of this properly and clean your tanks and all those things. So we're not, I mean, we, we don't need zebra mussels in some strange location because of this. So, so anyway, that was the big commotion and it's still ongoing there. I'm, I'm on a planning call about it first thing tomorrow morning. So well, we're grateful that you're over. here. Um, yes. So um, I don't see any more questions. So, well, for the people that are still on, I want to do a final plug for our, our remaining events, if you don't mind. Um, so sure. next week we have a virtual art walkthrough with Wendy Marquis. Um, we're going to be painting a royal wolf fly on a beautiful wood panel from Montana Reclaimed Lumber. So there are still spots open for both of those walkthroughs um, available on our website, the One Book Belgrade site where you logged on for this one or registered for this event. And then on the 25th, so in two weeks from today, Keith McCafferty will be um, here to talk about writing the book, writing the series, you know, differences between writing for Field and Stream and writing his novels and things like that and being a fly fisherman. So um, we hope you can join us for both of those. And um, everybody who's logged on will get credit for towards the uh, the drawings. So thank you for, for participating. Even if you're just trying to win a fly fishing trip, we're glad you're here learning about <laughs> something cool, I think. Um, and that has affected Montana and Montanans. Um, Anything yeah. else, Leah, before we log off? I know we have quite a bit of time left, but everybody's probably ready to go too. So <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll cut it short if everybody's okay. good. Yeah. Well, right. If anything. there's, yeah. there's other resources out there, if you want to know more about Whirling Seas, but thank you so much for the opportunity. I hope, yeah. um, I hope everybody's learned something. So. Yeah, I know thank I did. So um, thank you for being here. And okay. when you log off, you'll get a survey, everybody. So please do take a minute to fill that out. Even if you just say where you heard about the event, we appreciate it. Um, otherwise, the recording will be up a little later this month and uh, hope you enjoyed the event. So thank you, Leah. Thank you. Bye.